Hello and thanks for joining us for our mid-morning edition of Adidang News. I'm Mark Broom. Let's start by taking a look at the day's headlines. Trade showdown in Bangkok. The foreign ministers of South Korea and Japan are set for talks on Tokyo's export curbs on Seoul. The discussions come as Japan looks primed to stiffen its controls on South Korea even further. As the UN Security Council readies to meet over North Korea's latest missile tests, the North claims the missiles were not ballistic. This counters South Korea's assessment that they were. Plus, the Federal Reserve cuts US interest rates for the first time since the 2008 global financial crisis. North Korea state media has released a report about its missile launch that occurred just over 24 hours ago now. It said under Kim Jong-un's direct supervision, the regime test fired a new rocket system, which is different from the analysis that South Korea laid out on Wednesday. For more, we have our Unification Ministry correspondent Oh Jung-hee on the line. So Jung-hee, fill us in. Mark, Pyongyang Sea-run Korean Central News Agency, as usual, released a report this morning about its rocket test the previous day, and it confirmed uh, that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un oversaw the test fire of a newly developed large-caliber multiple-launch guided rocket system. Uh, the agency added that the North's new multiple rocket launcher has reached the design numerical values and proved its combat effectiveness. The North's leader Kim Jong-un commented that the launch was great, and this would be a, quote, inescapable capable distress to a fat target of the weapon. Although the report did not clarify who Pyongyang's fat target would be, speculation is that the North is once again taking aim at South Korea for its military drills with the U.S. scheduled for later this month. But unlike last week, Pyongyang did not ex uh, explicitly say uh, that the launch was an intended show of force, instead describing it as just a test fire. Now, what the North says it fired, a multiple launch guided rocket system, is different from what the South Korean military had announced the day before. As Howard had said, North Korea fired, quote, short-range ballistic missiles. It is possible that the military confused the multiple rocket launcher with short-range ballistic missiles because they have similar flying ranges. And uh, we will have to hear further from the military today, and I'll make sure to keep you posted. Mark. OK, jung -Yi, thank you very much for that report. Now, Britain, Germany and France have requested the UN Security Council hold a closed-door meeting Thursday to discuss North Korea's recent missile launches. Speaking on Wednesday, a spokesman for the UN said Secretary-General Antonio Guterres believes the launches are just another reminder of the importance of restarting talks on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The launches violate UN Security Council resolutions as Pyongyang is subject to sanctions over its illicit use of ballistic missile technology. Now, a North Korean man has been taken into custody by South Korean authorities after attempting to cross the border. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff says the man was spotted moving southward from the Imjingang River late Wednesday towards the military demarcation line inside the DMZ. A probe is underway on whether the man wants to defect as well as how he was able to actually cross the border. The military says there were no unusual movements by the North Korean military at the time. Now, South Korea's top diplomat, Kang kyung hwa is in Thailand for the ASEAN Forum. She will hold bilateral talks with her counterparts from various countries, including Japan. Could this be a sign the two might be willing to reach a compromise over Tokyo's export curbs on Seoul? South Korea is hoping for a breakthrough as Japan looks set to take Seoul off its whitelist of countries with preferential trade conditions. So a big day ahead for more. Let's connect to our foreign affairs correspondent, E.G. Won, who is in Bangkok for us. G. Won. Mark, the bilateral sit down between ministers Kang Kyung hwa and Taro Kono is due to start in about 45 minutes. Now, the talk is expected to last around 45 minutes, but it could go longer as these bilateral talks tend to do. 
Now, this will be the first time the two ministers will be seeing face to face after Japan imposed uh, retaliatory trade restrictions on Seoul in July. But it's unlikely they'll find a solution today, as Minister Kang said on Wednesday, that she will strongly convey Seoul's stance to Kono that Tokyo's export controls are unfair while hoping to extract Japan's understanding that diplomatic talks are needed going forward so their bilateral ties don't completely fall apart. Seoul's nuclear envoy Yi Do-hun, Deputy Minister for Political Affairs Yoon sun gu and Director General for Asian and Pacific Affairs Kim Jong-han will accompany Minister Kang at the talks. Now, after that, Kang will have another sit-down, this time with China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi. In the afternoon, she'll have more bilateral discussions before she attends her first multinational ministerial meeting with her ASEAN counterparts at 4 p.m. local time. Kang's main focus will be to relay Seoul's stance on Japan's export controls and highlight that the spirit of free trade must not be hindered if they want to ensure regional co-prosperity. I'll bring you more updates throughout the day on that once we have the details. Okay, thank you very much for that, G1. That was our EG1 live from Bangkok, the capital of Thailand, where the ASEAN Forum is about to get underway. And of course, those big bilateral ties between South Korea and Japan. And, and uh, on a related note, Tokyo has reiterated that it does actually remain committed to removing South Korea from its so called whitelist of trading countries, while Japanese media forecasts. Uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's cabinet will greenlight the measure on Friday. One party in Japan has warned the government in Tokyo to have a big rethink of what it's about to do. Kim Hyo-sun reports. Japan plans to push forward with its plan to remove South Korea from its whitelist of countries that enjoy preferential treatment in trade. Japanese Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihide Suga said Wednesday that such a measure is necessary for Tokyo's security. The relationship between Japan and South Korea has been extremely difficult due to the numerous negative actions by South Korea. There is no change to our stance that we would urge South Korea to take constructive actions based on our consistent stance towards many issues. The comments came just hours after U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said he plans to sit down with the foreign ministers of Seoul and Tokyo on the sidelines of ASEAN meetings in Bangkok. But Japan's Kyoto News Agency reports Tokyo will not embrace Washington's mediation, adding Japan will continue to deliver its consistent stance to the U.S. Japanese Trade Minister Hiroshi Seko also stressed Tokyo will press ahead with the export curbs. Japanese media forecast the cabinet will approve the measure on Friday, enabling it to come into force later this month. Meanwhile, the Japanese Communist Party has urged a ruling Liberal Democratic Party to hold Seoul's exclusion from Tokyo's whitelist. In a written opinion to the Japanese government, the party said it was concerned such a move would seriously damage bilateral relations. It also stressed the two countries need to resolve such tensions through diplomacy. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. Now, a meeting between a parliamentary delegation from South Korea and a senior member of Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party in Tokyo has been abruptly cancelled. The lawmakers were due to sit down with Toshihiro Nikai, who has close ties with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, but the Japanese side scrapped the talk, citing an urgent security meeting. It's the second time they've postponed the meeting that was initially set for Wednesday. These would have been key talks for South Korea. As we heard, Tokyo is poised to remove Seoul from its trade whitelist. The South Korean side has called the cancellation a diplomatic discourtesy. Japanese lawmakers from a related uh, parliamentarians union has apologized for the move. Now, it was widely expected, but still a highly significant move nonetheless, and uh, undoubtedly music to the ears of President Trump, who's been pushing very hard for it. The US Federal Reserve has cut rates for the first time in more than a decade, led by its chairman, Jerome Powell. Fed policymakers voted on Wednesday local time in favor of cutting the federal funds rate. They also committed to sustain uh, the country's longest economic expansion 
in history now. Ethan Jay reports. The U.S. Federal Reserve lowered its interest rates on Wednesday for the first time since the 2008 global financial crisis. Led by Fed Chairman Jerome Powell, policymakers voted 8 to 2 in favor of a small cut. The cut, widely forecast by analysts, affects the cost of borrowing for credit cards and mortgages in the U.S. and will hover between the 2 percent to 2 and a quarter percent range. We decided today to lower the target for the federal funds rate by a quarter of a percentage point to a range of 2 percent to 2 and a quarter percent. The outlook for the U.S. economy remains favorable, and this action is designed to support that outlook. President Trump has long criticized the Fed and its current chair, saying they're not doing enough to boost the American economy. However, according to Powell, the decision to cut rates was not affected by Trump's constant criticisms, but instead done in the hope it boosts the U.S. economy in the face of a global economic slowdown. Through the course of the year, weak global growth, trade policy uncertainty and muted inflation have prompted the FOMC to adjust its assessment of the appropriate path of interest rates. The committee moved from expecting rate increases this year to a patient stance about any changes and then to today's action. Major U.S. stock indexes plunged after the announcement. Watchers say Wall Street has priced in a more aggressive rate cut of half a percentage point rather than the quarter point cut that wound up happening. The smaller cut prompted a stock sell off and pushed bond yields higher. However, with the Fed also pledging to act as appropriate to sustain the expansion, market analysts believe further rate cuts are in the pipeline. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. Now, highly anticipated trade talks between senior officials from the U.S. and China wrapped up in Shanghai on Wednesday with little progress made between the world's two economic superpowers. However, they will pick things up where they left off uh, early next month, meaning there's still a flicker of hope uh, for a possible breakthrough in the uh, future. But considering how it's been going, who knows? Parky June reports. No deal between the U.S. and China. The two sides wrapped up their two-day trade negotiations in Shanghai on Wednesday with no clear progress made. However, they did agree to continue talks in Washington in early September. It was their 12th round of negotiations and the first face-to-face -face between the two sides in two months. The U.S. delegation was led by Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin and Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer. The Chinese delegation by Vice Premier Liu He. The White House described the talks as constructive. It said the two sides discussed a range of topics from forced technology transfer and intellectual property rights to non-tariff barriers. It added China promised to buy more U.S. farm products. That's expected to offer some relief to the U.S. agriculture industry that's been impacted by the trade disputes. China's Commerce Ministry also labeled the Shanghai negotiations candid, highly effective and constructive. According to the Wall Street Journal, the limited progress was partly a result of China's tactic to try and reach a more favorable outcome. It said the Chinese appear willing to negotiate, but are stalling in the belief they can extract better terms from the U.S. by not rushing into concessions. Trump tweeted on the first day of the negotiations that he expected Beijing to engage in such a strategy. But he warned it will not be a smart approach, saying it will be more difficult for China to reach a deal if he's re-elected in 2020. With the lack of progress made in Shanghai, there's growing skepticism the trade conflict can be resolved before the U.S. presidential elections are held in November next year. Park Kijun, Arirang News. Now, South Korea's exports slumped 11 percent on year in July. The trade ministry says it is the eighth month in a row that exports have fallen now. Outbound shipments came to around 46 billion U.S. dollars, down from the 52 billion tallied a year earlier. The ministry pointed to a fall in semiconductor prices as well as the U.S.-China trade war imports. They also fell, but by far less, 2.7 percent on year to around 44 billion dollars. The chief executive of Samsung Electronics, Kim Kinam, has made it onto the world's uh, a list of the world's most influential CEOs this year, becoming the only South Korean business leader 
uh, to have that honour. The head of the nation's leading chipmaker was named as the world's 13th most influential chief executive by CEO World magazine. Kim was also the third most influential CEO out of the IT firms on the list behind Apple's Tim Cook and Amazon's Jeff Bezos. They came ninth and 11th respectively on the overall list. CEO World magazine measured more than 1,200 CEOs from around the world and considered the brand's newsworthiness, impact, change in market capitalization and social issues when drawing up their list. Now, dozens of people have been charged with rioting over their alleged role in the Hong Kong protests. The massive anti-Beijing protests have become increasingly violent over the weeks as a really overwhelmed local police force and counter-protesters have been uh, going back and forward against each other uh, with a large amount of force. For more on this and other news from around the world, let's turn to our Hong Yu. So tell us about these people who have been charged and just exactly how the other protesters uh, reacted to the news. Well, Mark, those charged are just a tiny portion of the hundreds of thousands of pro-democracy protesters that gather every weekend in Hong Kong to demand a complete withdrawal of the now suspended extradition bill. But they marched beyond the authorized demonstration zone to the city center where the protests became illegal and led to violent clashes with riot police. Among the 44 arrested were an airline pilot, a teacher, a nurse, and even a 16-year-old girl. Hearing they could face up to 10 years in prison if convicted, hundreds of people gathered outside the Kwai Chung police station to demand the detained protesters release. Protesters threw objects at the police and a commander was seen aiming a rifle directly at them. The rest of protesters were released on bail on Wednesday on the condition of a curfew and they have to report to the police every week. Even more protesters could be arrested in coming days as the police have started an active investigation. Germany has rejected a U.S. request for Berlin to send warships to secure maritime traffic in the Strait of Hormuz. Washington recently asked if its allies to participate in a mission to protect tankers from seizure by Iranian forces. Germany reportedly appeared cool, but on Wednesday they had commented publicly that they will not take part in the operations. Germany said their participation would only contribute to intensifying tensions with Iran, and they intend to do the opposite. Time now for our Life and Info segment where we focus on information that we do hope will be useful in your everyday life. Today we're going to focus on some culture and uh, the arts as well and to tell us uh, more about uh, some events that we can enjoy uh, this weekend and weekends in the future. I'm happy to say that our E Min Sun joins us again in the studio. So Min Sun, what do you have for us this morning? Hi, Mark. Last time I was in the studio, I introduced some cultural performances to enjoy on weekdays after work. And today I'm going to introduce um, a weekend performance called Saturday Performance of Korean Music and Dance. It's a regular performance that has been taking place for over 30 years on Saturdays at the National Kugak Center. These Saturday performances, which run for 90 minutes, consist of Korean traditional music, dance and singing performances. In the first week of August, it will present some traditional musical instruments like kayagum, the Korean harp or samulnuri, a traditional percussion quartet, along with tepyongso, the conical oboe. Performers will complement the music with traditional singing and dancing. And throughout August, some more familiar forms of traditional music and dances will be presented. Some folk songs from the Jeollado provincial area and royal ancestral rites music will be performed. Royal Ancestral Rites music is a kind of music played at Jongmyo Shrine. You can also enjoy a range of traditional dances like fan dance, Buddhist dance, and Gangang Sule, the traditional Korean circle dance play performed under the full moon. Another performance is the Bongsan Talchum, a traditional mask dance that originates from Hwangedo province in North Korea. 
Taltum is known for its humorous satire of the upper class and portrayal of common people's lives. It's also fun to see the different facial expressions on masks. Okay, so what we can see is there are a whole range of traditional Korean dance and music that we can enjoy. But I think I can speak for a great many people uh, when I say that you are kind of intimidated a little bit by the Korean traditional arts and music scene because if you feel like you don't know the background, it can be hard to understand. But I hear some help may be at hand. Right, that's how many, uh, some people, Koreans and non-Koreans, feel about traditional music and dance performances mm. because they are not familiar with it. And to make the traditional arts more inclusive, the National Kugak Center is offering commentaries at its Saturday performances. Unfortunately, it's not offered on every uh, Saturdays, but there are two scheduled in September, in the first and the last week of the month. A commentator will provide an overview of the performance and explain the historical background and characteristics of each song and performance. And these comments will be shown on large screens both in Korean and English, so foreign audiences will not be left out. Admission for Saturday performance of Korean music and dance is from 10,000 to 20,000 won, about 8.5 to 17 US dollars a person. And for those who want to start their weekend early, there's Friday Contemporary Kugak Concert in August. Friday concerts combine some contemporary elements and even classical music to lower the bar for newcomers. Okay, great. So either Friday or Saturdays, you can go and check out these performances. Presumably the Friday ones are in the evening for people who have to work. And I have to say the price is very reasonable as well, only about uh, 10 to $20 per person for something as grand as that. Min San, thank you very much for joining us in the studio today. Yeah, thank you for having me. With that then, uh, let's take a quick look at some of the other cultural events because there are a lot of them happening all the time here in South Korea. Good morning. Heavy clouds that dropped rain overnight are moving away, but showers are still likely to linger until noon. And the weather agency has issued a heavy rain advisory for parts of Gyeonggi-do province. Meanwhile, southern provinces could see some sporadic showers again today, so have an umbrella handy. Meanwhile, southern parts of the country and the east coast are dealing with intense heat and temperatures are expected to rise even further today with an advisory being upgraded to warnings in more and more areas. So Daegu and Gyeongju will hit 36 and 37 degrees Celsius this afternoon, but thankfully Seoul will get some relief with a high of 30 degrees this afternoon. But upper regions will also have seasoning temperatures starting Friday into next week. So get ready for the peak of the summer heat in Korea. That's Korea for you and here's the international weather for viewers around the world.
Well, that's where we're going to leave the news and weather for now on this uh, Thursday morning here in Seoul. Stay tuned to Adirang TV. Plenty more coming up, including our next newscast at noon Korea time around an hour and a half from now. So until then, goodbye.